Okay, so this is our first time with Marcel. This is also our first time with some more difficult material, and I saw that most of you were suffering. <laughs> so let's take a toll. A toll. A toll. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Complete, um, what do you call it? The Freudian slip. It took a toll on you. Let's take a poll. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> let's take a poll. Uh, and see if there's any Marcel lovers in the class. So, um, 10 for Marcel. 10 means it's amazing. Any 10s for Marcel? Okay, 9, 8, 7. Wow. Okay, Jasper, Ahmad, 6, 5. Okay, now we're getting low. 4. <laughs> Wait, who's that? I don't see your name. Oh, shit. Cueva, I think right um Cueva you have four uh three two one oh hold on <laughs> Islam all right let's start with the haters Islam and Cologne what happened <laughs> personally I just have a hard time understanding what what he's trying to say yes yes I do like that that he's open to criticism you know I like that <laughs> Yes, and his own views, so doesn't mean you don't like it if you don't understand him, right? When you're gonna be married, you won't understand her, but you still like her, right? <laughs> when is to find someone that you can understand before doing so. so. It doesn't exist. <laughs> I'm just letting you know. <laughs> Give you a heads up. Right? This is great preparation for marriage, guys. <laughs> How to love someone you don't understand. Okay, Islam, tell us. Um, I'm actually, I raised my hand, but I think that was because of my inadequate understanding of myself fully and also like how to, how to actually connect him with Nietzsche with our approaching approach to suffering. But yeah, yeah I, I, I think on the essay, I'd be able to explain a little bit more. All right. Good. Uh, good. I just don't understand. I didn't, I feel like I couldn't understand him enough. Okay, to like I to empathize with him. Yeah. Fair but my other that is probably good. Fair enough, fair enough. Okay, lovers. This is Ahmad and Jasper, right? Um go ahead. Maybe Jasper, you wanna start? Um it was kind of like uh it was kind of confusing, but then I, I did a lot of I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I did a lot of Googling. <laughs> good. I Googled good. some references and stuff like that, and I just uh I, I agreed with a lot. Um, it kind of seems like, like from kind of what I understood is like, he's still borderline, like somewhat religious, but someone believes it, but his religion is not really religion. It's more like metaphysics, but yep. like, I kind of agree with like some of the concepts he had. Yep. Yep. You're pretty close. Nice. Uh, nice. You're getting it. I think, um, Ahmad, do you want to end? <laughs> I wouldn't consider myself a lover. But like the only reason why I gave him a seven was because of the introduction you gave us on him. I like his concepts of mystery and being, but this guy just it's he, he makes he makes a whole roller coaster of something that I think is could be explained much simpler. Okay. Like I think Carl Jung was a contemporary of his, but I think he 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 speaks along similar lines too, doesn't he? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's somewhat Jung, right, Carl Jung? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Jung is talking about a collective unconscious, right? And Marcel is talking about this deeper dimension of being. So yeah, you can say they're kind of going in the same direction. Yeah, I like that. I like that comparison. Um, you, among others, so there were, I'm look, I was reading your reading assignments, right? And there were two complaints that I want to address briefly before we get into the text. Um, so one of, some of you were like, why is he complicating his life so much, right? That's what Ahmad, you're saying also. Why is he making it so complicated? Isn't there a simpler way to say all of this, right? Now, you've got to remember where he is philosophizing, right? Um, this is right after the war. And he probably has PTSD, <laughs> right? This is somebody who is a survivor who, who was in a war. Uh, ask any veteran when they emerge from the war, how difficult it is, right, to find meaning again, to find some kind of anchor, right? He is, he is living in a world that has been stripped of all meaning, of all mystery, of all beauty, right? Of all hope, of all love, of all joy. This is a post-war writing, right? So 
he is, uh, there is nothing in the world which could inspire him to write about meaning, right? Everything has become meaningless. So it's not like here we're in Queens, right? And we have nice families, sort of, you know, and you know, there's no war and we have, you know, I mean, we struggle, but it's not like there's no like widespread death, no bombing, right? So we, it's easier for us to think about the meaning of life, right? But he is coming right out of a completely disastrous, traumatic uh, collective event, right? Which was World War I. And so it's not obvious. Meaning has become hidden. Hope has become lost. There's no more joy. There's no more peace. This is someone who has PTSD, right? And so, and yet, right, he's trying to dig through the rubble right this is you got to visualize it like this right europe has fallen into rubble <laughs> and he is there and philosophically right uh, spiritually and he's there digging trying to find this lost connection right most of you in this class have some kind of natural spiritual connection because you grew up in some kind of religious context right so it's more natural he didn't have one and now everything has been shattered right so he's he's there's a kind of desperation in Marcel to, to dig through the rubble and to find this lost um, meaning or this lost peace and joy, right? And so that's why it seems so complicated, right? Because he doesn't know where he is and he's looking. <laughs> are, you, are you seeing what I'm saying? Right? A lot of us, we, we, first, we, we, don't, uh, we don't realize that a lot of philosophers when they write, it's not their conclusions, it's their search. Okay, let me write this in the chat because this is so important, right? A lot of philosophers, when they're writing, right? Especially in the 20th century, it's not their conclusions, it's their search. Just to know this will reconcile you with a lot of 20th century writers. They're not, they're trying to find something and they're bringing us into their struggle. And that's why it's convoluted, it's complicated, because they're trying to find something that is not obvious, that is complicated for them to find in the political, social context they live in, right? Existential context. And that's why we are brought into his struggle. Does this help a little bit? Some of you put the hand in the screen if, if this helps you reconcile a little bit with his writing, right? With the way that it's unclear because he's unclear right it's 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 complicated because he is all confused and everything is complicated and he's struggling to wrench meaning out of meaninglessness right okay i think islam had a question go ahead um i have a question i think that helps understand his perspective much more because i guess it was very hard to empathize because just like you mentioned uh a lot of us grew up with like a lot of spiritual backgrounds we have some type of anchor or some type of starting point but to have that happen and not have any anchor or something to go back to for hope because what is faith at the end of the day it's all hope based on hope so i feel like yeah it makes much, much makes yeah makes much more sense sorry um that yeah that, that's just perfect you got it right you got it a lot of us have some kind of spiritual anchor or at least family anchor community anchor right this is a man who has lost everything he has no family anchor right remember his mom died <laughs> right he has lost he never had a spiritual anchor right as he's writing these texts so he is just and yet he senses there must be something right he is somebody in a way who is an agnostic um He's, he's spiritual, you know, in, an, in, in a way that's not connected to religion. He's just spiritual, but he senses there must be something and he's just struggling to find that meaning in a world that has, you know, been destroyed. Um, so yeah, Ahmed, absolutely, right? Ahmed writes in the chat, would you say he's writing while introspecting? Absolutely, he's bringing us into his own musings. We're entering his brain, imagine. <laughs> You're entering the mind of somebody suffering from PTSD. This is why right? Remember, he's not like Kant. Oh, did we do Kant? No, who did we do? That was kind of uh, Maimonides, right? My Maimonides is very peaceful writing, <laughs> right? He's sitting somewhere in Cairo, <laughs> right? in Egypt. There's no war. He has figured it all out, right? And he's, he's very serenely writing his conclusions, right? This is someone who everything has exploded around him and in him emotionally, right? 
and he's trying to piece it back together somehow, right? And that's why it's so hard to understand. And by the way, our next philosopher living us, worse, same problem, PTSD, right? This is intellectual PTSD, <laughs> right? This is somebody living us, it's worse than Marcel will see and his writing is worse because living us lost his whole family, right? In, in World War II. So these are war torn psyches, right? And that's why they write like this. And we have to be able to empathize, right? With this is not them trying to be elitist or, you know, make you eat their dust, right? <laughs> this is them struggling intellectually. There is an intellectual trauma that they're trying to sort out, right? Okay, so this should help a little bit. Any other questions before I, I continue? Another issue that some of you were asking, well, I think I answered that. Okay, so I think I answered, um, okay. Before I go further, uh, Amazon, can you stay after class uh, briefly, please? Amazon, are you here? I just remembered, okay, hopefully you got that. Uh, al Hadai, go ahead. <clears throat> I know what he's saying and I understand it, but why I believe him, why I believe his concept of mystery, being, and evil, and all these things, is he just saying that because he's complex and he just came out from a war. So he just saying these things because it's his trauma. So why I believe him? Uh, because he's going to give us a proof, right? So absolutely, this could be Nietzsche. You're, you're speaking for Nietzsche. Thank you, <laughs> right? You're a Nietzsche spokesperson. Nietzsche would say, oh, you're projecting <laughs> because you're, tra you're, you're in trauma, right? Nietzsche would step right in and say exactly what you said. Oh, you're projecting because you're in a state of wretchedness, trauma. But what we're going to see is that what Marcel is talking about, and make sure you write this down, it's not a projection, it's an experience. And this is the key, right? An experience you can't make up. A projection you can make up in your mind. An experience is felt in your body. And more on this later. So I'm, so he's really going to be telling. The way he describes it is going to make it, um, we're going to be, uh, how shall I put it? He's going to describe it in terms of a reality, not a projection. I mean, in other words, at the end of his demonstration, it will be more or less clear that it is a reality he's talking about and, and not something he created in his mind. So, and we'll get to that um, when we talk about the feelings, right? Then. Okay, great. All right, so let's get in the text. Um, remember, I gave you the outline last time. So number one, we're going to talk about the disenchanted world and despair, again, but with some quotes this time. And then number two, we'll talk about being and then... Uh, the feelings of uh, love, hope, presence, right? Okay, so remember I mentioned last time, right? Or even now, right? Marcel is in this rubble, <laughs> right? Everything has been torn down, both in the, in the infrastructure, <laughs> right? And in, in his mind, right? In the psyche, in the European psyche at that moment, everything is just in shambles, right? There's no meaning, there's no hope. Remember, Europe, uh, before the war, had forfeited uh, its connection to religion, right? So Europe, before the war, was largely secular. So there's nothing really to fall back on, right? When something like this, Europe was relying on its culture, right? Europe was relying on its institutions, right? And what we saw during the two wars is the complete destruction of the culture and of the institutions. At that moment, there's nothing spiritual left for the Europeans to hang on to, right? They relied on their political system, right? They relied on their art, <laughs> right? And when the war comes and, and just sweeps everything away, right? All the institutions are destroyed. They don't they can't hold back the tide of evil. They're swept away by the tide of evil. Government becomes a tool for evil, right? The Europeans have nothing left to hang on to. And that's where Marcel comes in. He's not religious. He can't go to religion and, you know, do some prayers, right? But he knows there's something more and he's digging for it, right? And so that's really what he's saying here when he says that we have lost as a culture, talking about Europe, the sense of mystery. We've, 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 we've pushed religion away and we haven't replaced it with something else, right? We pushed religion away and then we said, there is only what we can see, hear, touch, the material world, that's it, right? This was the decision 
that the Europeans made, right? We were not going to talk about God, angels, miracles, right? Spirit. We're just going to leave that behind, right? And in doing so, they didn't reconnect with anything else. It all became just pure material world. The political, the art, right? The arts, our civilization, this is all that matters. When this is destroyed, there's nothing left to anchor. So here's the quote for that, right? Go to page um, 12, last paragraph. It should be noted. Who is there? Put your hand in the screen. Okay. So he says this here, right? It should be noted that this world is on the one hand riddled with problems and on the other determined to allow no room for mystery. So let's look at that distinction between problem and mystery because this is crucial. To see everything as a problem is to basically, it's the scientific worldview. Everything eventually has a solution. We can eventually understand everything, solve everything, control everything, right? This is the mindset of the West, right? Eventually we'll figure out a vaccine for COVID, right? Eventually we'll figure out uh, how to, uh, you know, take care of this problem and so forth. So the, the, the mentality where everything is a problem is really the mentality, right? So uh, people who see problems everywhere, right? In a way, they, they see that they have the power, right, to um, resolve those problems, right? Um, right, so, so this is the scientific world. This is our, the Western worldview, right, that there is not really anything beyond our control. We can eventually take control. And what Marcel is saying is that, no, there are things in this life which are beyond our control and which, which in a way carve out a space for mystery. Right, so if you're if you're a typical Westerner, right, for you the only thing that exists is what you can see. <laughs> if you can't see it, it doesn't exist, right? What what you can see, feel, touch, this is all that matters and that exists. Anything else is a waste of time, right? This is the Western mindset that Marcel is saying. This is a mindset thinking that everything is a problem that you can figure out. <laughs> Okay, are you getting this, right? So the Western mindset is simply a mindset which thinks, right, that everything in life is a problem that can be fixed or figured out and so forth, right? And so what Marcel is saying, this kind of mindset doesn't realize that there are things in this life that cannot be figured out, that cannot be fixed, that cannot be controlled, that cannot be understood. Right? There's a deeper dimension to our life, and that's what he calls mystery. Right? Um, and he's saying, right, without this sense of mystery, we are living in a very hollow world. That's what he means when he says the world is hollow right here, right, in our passage. So let's go a little bit, uh, one to third paragraph on page 12, right? That's where he talks about the hollow. Put your hand in the screen. I have written. Are you there? Okay. I have written on another occasion that provided it is taken in its metaphysical and not its physical sense, the distinction between the full, okay, it's complicated, let me go further, life in a world, are you there? <laughs> life in a world centered on function, okay. <laughs> life in a world centered on function is liable to despair because in reality the world is empty, it rings hollow, right? So this is a world where there's no mystery, where the only thing that matters is what we can see. And for, for Marcel, such a world is hollow because when the war comes, the war destroys everything that we see, right? Everything that we hung on to, our institutions, right? Our loved ones, uh, our books or our, right? Everything is swept away by the war and now there is nothing to hold on to. And at that moment, everything seems empty, right? This is page 12. Okay. Are we clear so far with this notion of problem and mystery and how, why the world is hollow for Marcel? Uh, put your hand on the screen if you're following. Uh, okay, good. So now he continues and say, actually, right, there are already certain liminal experiences. Let me write this in the chat, right? This is uh, liminal experiences that we all have, uh, which point to mystery. So he talks about three of them in the next page, right? He talks about birth, love, and death, right? Um, typing them in the chat furiously. Okay, so he's saying, actually, we all have a taste of this beyond, of this mysterious dimension, of this dimension of depth. Again, when I say depth, I'm not saying death, depth. <laughs> 
putting it in the chat. Some of you are going to think I'm saying depth. I know it. Okay, depth meaning deep, dimension that is deep. Okay, so so he's saying that right. We can already experience mystery through these three liminal, right? Um, uh, what's another word for liminal? Um, um, borderline, borderline experiences, right? So birth, for example, right? I mean, any of you who have witnessed a birth, right? You know that it's incredible, right? The, the way that somehow a human being can just come out, right? And yeah, we know the scientific explanation, right? This plus this and therefore this and then developed into that and so forth. But still, the experience of the birth is so powerful that you sense there is more happening than just chemical reactions, right? So the experience of birth is already an extraordinary intrusion into our lives of mystery, right? Um, he continues love. Well, we're going to talk today a little bit about love, right? This, this notion that you can find someone out of how many people in the world? Six, 12? How many billion? I forgot. Somebody help me. <laughs> how many billion? Where are we at? How many? Seven billion. That's it. Okay, great. So seven billion people. And, and not all of us is true, but some of us, right? Out of the 7 billion people, we find person perfectly matches us, right? And sometimes you have to, from two different countries, they all, they find a way to meet, right? So certain love experiences, right? The, the encounter with the soulmate is completely mysterious. How did we meet, right? When you come from here and I come from there, you're from this economic background, I'm from this one, right? How did we end up together? This is mysterious. We're gonna talk about this, I think, today. And then, of course, death, right? Now, what's interesting about Marcel um, is that he doesn't see death necessarily as something evil. He sees it as something mysterious, right? We don't understand death. We don't control death. We don't know anything about death. And in that sense, at the moment of death, this mystery again erupts into our lives, right? So are you seeing how these three experiences are really moments where mystery is erupting into your life without it being religious at all, right? These are human experiences whereby you can get a glimpse into this dimension of mystery which is all around us. Are we clear on that? Put your hand. Okay, um, great. So, all right. So now, of course, he's going to go, we need to, you know, continue to see how he's going to argue for this dimension of mystery. Already these three experiences, you know, they can speak to that. But Marcel is going to go further and he's going to try to define what he means by this mystery. Because what we're going to see is that Marcel understands this mystery very different from the people before him. Right. And this is where things get tricky um, and, and feel very uh, metaphysical. So let's go a little deeper into Marcel's notion of mystery. So I'm in my second section now when I talk about being, right? And then love, hope, and presence. So what does Marcel mean by mystery? So let's remember that he has several terms for it, right? Mystery, also the concept of being or ontological, uh, yeah, being. Right. So mystery equals, uh, mystery is another way for being, right? So what he's saying is that there is us existing right? There's us small beings in the world, and then there's our life, right? The fact that we are alive, what makes us alive, the source of our life, and this he calls being with a capital B, with an um, uh, uppercase B, right? So being is that which is the source of all beings, right? So he goes, so this is uh, this idea, right, that there is a source, right, that we all are coming from, or that there is some kind of intelligence behind everything, that there's some kind of mystery. This is not a new idea, right? Just this idea that there's a deeper dimension. This is typical philosophy. I'll give you a whole history right now of people saying exactly the same thing, right? So this is not, this is not the innovation. This is not the new idea here. So let me give you a few examples. You have this idea, of course, in Greek thought. I'm just going to write them all down. You have it in Greek thought, in Hindu thought, in Chinese thought, right? In um, uh, Christian, of course, uh, religious thought, right? All of these, right, are, are agreeing that there are two dimensions, right? The material and something deeper. So this is not new. You have different names for it, right? For the Greeks, they called this dimension uh, the uh, intelligence, right? or in Greek, nous, right? 
in uh, Hinduism, they call it um, the Brahman, right? Or the one. Uh, in Chinese thought, we call it the Tao, right? You've heard these concepts, and then in religious thought, they call it God, right? So this idea that there's something deep in the world which, you know, is our source is not new. Now, where Marcel is making a step beyond everybody else is he's saying this intelligence is not just a, you know, mathematical intelligence which controls the laws of nature, right? This is the Greek view, right? The Greeks thought there's an intelligence, laws of nature, it all makes sense, right? For Marcel, it's not just an intelligence, a kind of disembodied intelligence, right? It's not just a mathematical intelligence. It's an intelligence which is not only aware of us, but also on our side. Okay, so this is very different. It's person. He's describing a person, <laughs> right? So he's saying this mystery is not only aware of us, but is also on our side. So this is not just a mystery. This is a presence, right? He's talking about. So this is a, he personifies it, right? So this mystery he's talking about is really a presence. Uh, it is personified as something or someone, right? That is on our side. Uh, and um, yeah, that is on our side. Okay, so this is crazy, right? If you're listening to this, you're like, how in the world, right? Is he gonna argue for this, <laughs> right? This is not easy. You can argue easily that there is an intelligence in nature and you can just do math and you can figure it out, right? But that this is a personified presence, which is on our side. This is way beyond the <laughs> scientific realm. Delmas, go ahead. You have a question. Yeah, I, I wanted to make sure, is this, he wrote this before he became Catholic, correct? So I have to check, honestly, because I am not even... I know most of the stuff he wrote was before he was Catholic, so I have to see, because um, the book, of course, is a, is a compilation of essays, so the date of the book doesn't work. <laughs> I have to find out. I really need to, to find out. Let me make a note for myself. I have two notes to find out, actually. Um, yeah. I'm only saying that because, like you said, it would yeah, be yeah. a big leap. I, I know where you're going. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Right? Is he pulling this out of his Catholic <laughs> background? Um, I don't think he is. Remember, his friend was saying, what you're saying is Catholicism. And he's right. like, what? <laughs> so he hasn't written anything really uh, based on his Catholicism. Um, I think he mentions religion at the end of this essay, but I think the, the, the main plot of the essay already written way before, right? But I have to check exactly. It would be nice to know the exact date. I agree. <clears throat> okay. okay. Good, good question. All right, so now let's go and see how is he going to argue for this, right? That there is something which is on our side in a way, something which loves us, right? That's what he's saying. There is a source of love, right? So I'm, you know, I'm paraphrasing, that in a way uh, cares or loves us, right? So this is kind of where he's going. So how in the world is he going to make an argument for this. This is the tough part, right? Okay. So remember we talked about feelings in the introduction, right? I told you that Marcel is going to be telling us that he has an experience of being rather than just uh, being being just a kind of like projection of his mind, right? Like, Mar like a Nietzsche would uh, be tempted to say, right? So remember, right, let me say that again. I'm reminding you what al Hadai said, right? Nietzsche would tell Marcel, ah, you're coming up with this because you're so miserable, right? So you're creating this in your head. Ah, there is a being, with, there's a mystery which is on our side. Marcel is saying, no, I'm not creating this because I have experienced it in my flesh before I even thought it was possible. Remember, Marcel, agnostic. And yet he is hit throughout his life by these experiences which push him to uh, investigate something deeper than just what meets uh, the eye, right? So he's going to talk about, so let me be very clear, right? He's talking about an experience, not a thought, <laughs> right? This is something which happens to him, not something he came up with in his head, <laughs> right? This is happening in his body, not his mind. <laughs> Okay, 
So it's it's uh, it's uh, mediated by feelings, not thought. All right. So you're getting the the idea. Um, uh, so so let's um, let's explain a little bit, right? Let's review a little bit what we said last time about feelings. Right? Remember, I told you feelings we have determined already is never just an inner thing. It always points to something in the outside world, right? Feelings are, this is the technical term, feelings are intentional. They point to something outside, beyond, uh, in the world, right? Okay, so that's very important to remember. Feelings are intentional. They always point to something outside. Now, we know most of our feelings point to the average material world, right? Someone pisses you off, you're pissed. Someone makes you cry, you're crying, right? So usually most of our feelings point to a reality in the material, physical world, right? But then Marcel says there are certain feelings which you cannot find their cause in the physical realm. Therefore, he infers that perhaps, it's always just a perhaps, right? Perhaps there is a deeper dimension creating this feeling okay are we very clear on this let me write it in the chat right most of our feelings have a cause in the physical realm right but some feelings right have no cause in the, there right and so for Marcel right and this is a big maybe right maybe this infers right this implies maybe one could infer right let's put it like that one could infer that they are caused by a deeper dimension, right? In other words, at that moment that you're feeling this feeling, you're tapping into this deeper dimension or what um, Marcel calls a metaphysical dimension of what he calls mystery or being, right? So we saw already uh, last time we talked about ontological exigence, right? So this is, remember, this kind of feeling dissatisfied with life, even though you have everything you want. Uh, this is you longing, right, for something deeper, for a deeper reality. And at that moment, you are, that feeling you have is pointing to that reality. It's in a way caused by that reality beckoning you, kind of, right? There's something drawing you, something calling you, uh, making you feel nostalgic, right? So the cause of that feeling is in the metaphysical realm for Marcel. Are we clear so far? Everybody with me? Any questions? This is our review from last time. Now, what Marcel is going to talk about, we're going to only talk about one, which is love today. He's going to mention there are three other feelings which are also pointing to this dimension, right? And remember, this is his proof, right? He's just saying, yeah, yeah, Nietzsche, it makes sense. But here, this is not a projection. It's not a thought. This is an experience I'm having. I am, in a way, when I'm having these feelings, I am, in a way, a connecting to this deeper dimension. I am experiencing this deeper dimension, right? Because, or in a way, this deeper dimension is, uh, how shall I put it, is becoming evident through this feeling or through this experience I'm having right now. al Hadai, are you a little clearer so far? Thank you, Delmas, making itself known. <laughs> this deeper dimension is making itself known, right? I like that, or is manifesting, becoming evident through this experience that I'm having, through these feelings. Are you a little better? Okay, back to you, al Hadai. Are you a little better? Are you good? Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about love, hope, presence. Today, only uh, love, <laughs> right? And then next time, hope and presence. So this one on love is very interesting. I, I said love, but it's closer related to the feeling of fate, right, um, when it comes to love. Okay, so let's read together. This is on page 21. He talks about love for the first time in our text. And I'm just going to summarize <laughs> what he's doing in 21, and then we'll read a little bit, right? So this is, he's talking here about the experience of randomly encountering somebody who becomes a really imp big important part of your life, right? In other words, 
you meet, I mean, maybe I can ask you this. Have you ever met someone, had a friend or a lover that you feel, oh my God, we were meant to meet. Like, this is just, am this is amazing, right? I can't, like something happened that brought us together. You're sensing that something orchestrated this. How many of you have had this experience? You can put your hand in the screen. Okay, so a few of you, right? You, you have the feeling, right? It's a feeling that something must have brought you together. Now, when you're thinking about something bringing you together, what are you thinking except that there is something in the universe that's on your side, that's working for you, that's orchestrating this. Are you seeing what I'm saying? You don't even have to be religious. Anytime you think, oh man, this was meant to be. Anytime you say this, what are you saying? You're saying there's something making things happen for you. <laughs> there is a kind of uh, invisible hand. No. Please mute yourselves, guys. Yes, please mute yourself. And? All right. Please make sure you're muted, guys. Okay, right? So, um, so when anytime you say, right, this was meant to be, what you're really saying is that there is something in the universe working for me on my behalf, right? There is an invisible hand orchestrating my life, right? Or the universe has my back, right? When we talked about in these kind of new age terms, right? That the universe has my back, the universe trying to tell me something, universe brought us together. What do you say? You're talking about being, right? You're talking about what Marcel calls mystery or being, right? There is something working for us. So this feeling you have, it's not something you came in your mind, right? It's something you're feeling. Do you see the difference, right? This is not you meeting the love of your life and then interpreting intellectually that it was meant to be. Here's why, because you're not miserable at that moment. Remember, we project when we're miserable, right? Here you're fulfilled, you've met the love of your life and you have the distinct feeling, <laughs> right? That this was meant to be. This is not you creating this uh you know in your imagination because you're feeling miserable remember for nietzsche we project when when we're miserable otherwise we don't need to project right so that's why i'm saying what what marcel is talking about here is not a projection it's a feeling you have and th this feeling he says all he's saying is that this feeling why not take it seriously right you have the sense at that moment that something brought you together don't push it don't repress it don't uh, belittle it. Take it seriously. Take seriously the messages that are hidden in your feelings. That's what Marcel is saying. Take your experience seriously. Believe it, right? If your experience is giving you the sense, somebody is working for me, someone brought us together, believe it. Maybe it's true. <laughs> Am I making sense? Put your hand in the screen if you're following, right? So what Marcel is really saying is that um, take, uh, take your feelings, right, and experiences seriously. Don't dismiss them or despise them, right? Don't dismiss them in the name of rationality, right? Reason is going to be like, there is nothing like that. Prove it, <laughs> right? Your mind will kick in and be like, stop believing in fairy tales, <laughs> right? There's no one working for you. It's all, you know, chance. So part of you is going to argue, right? As soon as you have that feeling, oh, we were meant to be, and you're all romantic, and then your mind will kick in and be like, ah, stop, <laughs> right? Stop being an idiot, right? This is all, this is just random. It's, it's just luck, right? Um, but what Marcel is saying is before your mind destroys your experience and belittles it like it's a little kid who knows nothing, right? Why don't you, why do you choose reason over your feelings? Maybe your feelings know something your reason doesn't know, right? Very often we, we choose to listen to our reason over our feelings. And Marcel is saying, why choose reason over our feelings, right? Maybe, just maybe our feelings know something that our reason doesn't or have access to a reality that our reason doesn't have access to let me write this in the chat right or have access to a reality that our reason has no access to right so we were made with both feelings and reason both can be reliable why not right okay uh i had that is the argument working for you <laughs> All right, very good. Okay, so let's read. Sorry, sorry. Did you say something? 
Okay, great. All right, so let's read together the passage where he says all this, page 21. Second paragraph. Okay, first paragraph, sorry. Say that. Are you there? Put your hand. Okay. Say that I have made an encounter which has left a deep and lasting trace on my life. Okay, so you make an amazing encounter. And then I'm skipping now. Oh, yeah, let me say that. Yeah, this is good. Let me continue. It may happen to anyone to experience the deep, make sure you underline this, the deep spiritual significance of such a meeting. Yet, so you're experiencing that there is something significant. Something must have brought you together. Now you're there thinking this, right? And yet, this is something which philosophers have commonly ignored or disdained. To disdain is to despise, right? Doubtless, because it affects only the particular person as person, it cannot be universalized. It does not concern rational being in general. So in other words, most philosophers, even though we all have some of these experiences, we have this feeling that something worked together to bring us together. Yet most philosophers just, you know, poo-poo it. They're like, oh, this is nothing. Why? Because it's a, it's a knowledge which is subjective and not objective, right? Philosophers don't think it's possible to have subjective knowledge. They believe all knowledge must be objective. Remember Rumi? Should be remembering Rumi right now. Rumi talks about the knowledge of the heart, subjective knowledge, which he takes seriously. We're in the same place here with Marcel. This is a subjective feeling, and yet it is a knowledge worthy of our attention. Right? Karuchi, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, really quick. I, I just wanted to share with the class. I, I'm having this flashback to a movie that I saw a while ago called Shallow Hal. I don't know if everybody's or if anybody's seen that. It's a comedy with Jack Black. And, and to, to make a long story short, what happens is he's a man who sees everything in the world objectively and materially, especially women. And uh, he uh, he's given a, he has an experience with Tony Robbins in an elevator and Tony Robbins <laughs> changes him, you know, two seconds. <laughs> quote unquote, yeah. And now he sees every woman as a beautiful woman, um, even though to other people, they may not be right. So all he's looking at is the inner beauty. And then at the end, his friend like goes crazy. Like, you know, he's picking up these women that are unattractive and people are making fun of him. So he gets Tony Robbins to change him back. <laughs> And uh, what Jack Black says at the end is, uh, it doesn't matter what everybody else saw. I know what I felt and I know what I believed in those moments. Mm. Because he wound up falling in love with one of these women. Okay. And um, no, it just, it, it just, I don't know why it reminds me of that. Because what he was saying is he couldn't deny what he was feeling. Even though evidence was being presented to him that he's insane. Like nobody would feel this way about this person on the surface. Nobody would look at these women the way that you're looking at. And uh, it kind of describes this whole concept of, you know, your feelings may know more than the world around you. Yeah. And, um, I don't know why I made that connection. No, no, it's perfect. It's perfect, yeah. right? This is a, the, the movie is funny, right? But it does show how there is a knowledge, how the feelings in a way in this movie are tapping into the metaphysical realm. Right, he's able to sense their inner beauty, right? The feelings are able to make him push beyond the physical into the metaphysical. And even though no one else is seeing it, it's a, it's a reliable knowledge, right? So mm -hmm. it's, I think it's, it's exactly what we're talking about, right? It's in, in a kind of funny way. Excellent, very good. Yeah, I thought I would, if anybody saw the movie, it might help them kind of make that connection too. Yes, yes, I think I'll watch it. What's the name of it? Shallow Hal, I'll put it in the chat. Shallow hell, like a hell, like how, like uh, like oh, a name. Hell. Oh like hell, shallow hell. How funny. Okay, <laughs> good, excellent, very good. Okay, so um, where was I? Yeah, I think this quote is enough, right? This is just telling you how philosophers have ignored this whole uh, facet of human experience. Why? Because philosophers want knowledge to be objective. They're not interested in exploring subjective knowledge. It's harder. What Marcel is doing in the whole text, he's exploring this other way of knowing that we have, which is what Rumi talked about, the knowledge of the heart, right? Feelings versus the knowledge of the mind. And he's saying the heart or our feelings, I like how Karuchi put it because it clarifies, have an access 
into the metaphysical realm and therefore can be you know they are they know they have they have a way, they are a way of knowing and therefore can be trusted right so let me write this down right our subjective feelings um have an access right that our senses don't right or our reason doesn't um they are able right to tap into the metaphysical um, and what Marcel is inviting us to do is to take this feeling seriously because we might learn something, <laughs> right? We are at that moment accessing this deeper reality. And I think, I forget who it was who asked, how do we open up uh, to being? How do we access being? Was it Jenna Kopoulos? Was that you? It was one of, um, I can't remember. It was, uh, yes, last time, right? What Marcel is saying simply Anytime, right, somebody was asking, well, how do we reconnect to being? Who was it? Anybody remember who, who you were? Who was this person? Wasn't me, Professor. <laughs> I don't remember who it was. Okay. Um, but yeah, one of you <laughs> mentioned. Oh, Almulaki. Yes, yes, yes. It was uh, Almulaki, are you there? <laughs> Not there, I don't think. Okay. All right, good. So Almulaki mentioned, right? How do we, immediately Almulaki wanted to know directly, right? The, the most important question, how do we connect? We're disconnected, how do we connect? One of the ways to connect with say Marcel is take these feelings seriously. When you have a, a glimpse, when you have a moment where you're sensing this dimension, don't despise it, receive it. And you will have more and more manifestations of this dimension. The more you receive it, the more you take it seriously, the more intuitive you will become. Do you see what I'm saying? The more your feelings will become fine-tuned and will detect this dimension. So the best way, right, to connect to being more and more is each time you have this moment of connection where you're sensing it, be open to it and you will become more and more able to detect it right your feelings will become more finely attuned and you'll have many many more glimpses of being and at that moment you will feel much more anchored right uh, in that reality okay any questions on anything we said today all right i'm going to stop the recording